So thank you all. Thanks to KX for organizing this. Thanks to all of you for coming. Thank you to Mark and Abby and um, Finton, who are the people I know best, and all the other KX people that I don't know. Um, but it looks like a wonderful, looks a wonderful day plan. So what I want to talk about is how we at my company, Quantitative Brokers, use KX to process real-time trading signals. So quick bit of background so you just have um, a little sense of who we are. This is not lined up. Should I switch to the other? What? Oh, there it is. Okay. No, no, it's okay now. Um, so we do what our company does, Quantitative Brokers. We're an algorithmic execution broker. So we do algorithmic trade execution and transaction cost measurement. We're not prop trading. We don't do any market making. We only execute on behalf of clients. And the markets that we're in are futures and fixed income, so bonds and futures around the world. And the reason that my partner and I started this company about 10 years ago was we had been in algo execution and equities. That market was saturated, very well served, but nothing was happening in futures markets or bond markets. So we now are live on futures exchanges more or less around the world, Asia's in progress. We cover all products on those exchanges and also cash treasuries, which have some problems similar to equities like smart order routing. Um, a big thing that we do is multi-leg trades. So I'll show you some examples, um, futures versus futures, futures versus cash product. And the one thing I want to emphasize is that the metric of success for us is the execution cost that we get for the client relative to whatever benchmark that may be. So to sort of jump ahead to the conclusion of the talk, this is what the talk is about, is that the way we get good execution is we have good technology, so it's reliable, it needs to work, it needs to be efficient, we have to understand in great detail the markets that we trade in, and then most importantly for the, for the execution is our ability to make short-term predictions of the price. Is the price going to go up? Is the price going to go down? And, you know, it's not... Um, not, not really a commercial, but I'll just say that the one, the one vendor product that we use is KDB+. So we use it for historical data. We use it for what I'm talking about here, which is the real-time processing. Um, and since, you know, since we started the company, that's the one product we've been using. Um, so it's pretty central in our entire, our entire product, um, product system. So why is this not going? Oh, there we go. So here's an example of what we do. So this would be a typical client order. Whoops. It's the, these are big files, so it takes a little while. Um, that's because there's so much market data. So here's an example. So in this case, the client sent us an order by 221 lots of a, C, um, in this case, an S&P 500 futures trading on CME. So what we do is we track when we, at the order start time, we snapshot the arrival price, which is the bid offer midpoint at the time the order arrives. And what's shown here, by the way, the gray band is the bid offer spread. The blue and the red are market quotes. The greens are trades that printed in the market. And you can see what we're doing, which is these yellow boxes, which are limit orders that we place in the market. So basically what happens is we put limit orders in the market. We hope that they'll execute. In this case, the price came down through us. The yellow triangles are our fills. And so, and the yellow line is our cumulative average execution price. So when all is said and done, the final execution price is 2730.45, which we managed to buy lower than the, the arrival price. So we saved the client a bunch of money on that order. And what you can see, sorry, I don't have the uh, mic, so I'll go away as far as I can without losing the, the, the the sound. But what you can see is in this case, the, the reason we were successful was when the price came down, we got a bunch of fills when it came down, and then when it went up, we did not trade. So the ability to predict those little changes is, is really key to getting good results. Um, here's another example. So we also trade against other benchmarks. In this case, <clears throat> in this case, the instruction were 18 lots, a small order of um, CME ultra bond futures across a two-hour window from 1 p.m. to 3 p.m. And the instruction, the metric in this case, or the benchmark, was the average price across the interval. So we trade roughly according to a forecast volume profile, but we can deviate it, deviate from the profile a little bit ahead or behind to try to get better prices, uh, and then. What's you know, been sort of a key to a technological challenge is orders like this. So in this case, the instructions were to buy 306 uh, units of the 10-year Treasury futures trading in Chicago and simultaneously and in parallel and in coordination sell whatever that number is, 192 of the, um, of the lifelong gilt futures which trade in London. So we have an algo engine in Chicago, we have an algo engine in London. I didn't say, but I'll say it now, our algo engines are proximity hosted at the exchange with direct connection. So these two trading engines are each one trading on its own market, but they're communicating. And so 
to the extent you want to see the details, one of the things that happened here was in the, the London leg, we got a fill, so we basically completed the order where that vertical dotted line is, and normally we would cross and complete the other legs so they stay in parallel. In this case, actually, the algorithm decided that it was an acceptable risk to wait and take the risk that the price would move away, but we thought that the price was likely to come toward us, and in fact it did, so we got a better leg fill in, in Chicago. So the metric, again, is the average execution price on the combined order, and in this case, in fact, another thing that you can see is we're selling in London, the price went up, so we got we got fills above the market. We're buying in Chicago, the price went up. We got fills that were a little bit worse than the benchmark, but the combination of them, the net was better because these things are very correlated. They move together. So also from a study we did a couple years ago, just to emphasize that what we live or die by is the slippage numbers of execution price relative to benchmark. This is a study we did for a client just showing our algos compared to their other algos they had from other brokers, and the green numbers on the right show that we're saving them. Basically, those are dollars per lot executed, which, um, to put that in context for equity people, those are fractions, like fractions like a quarter or a fifth or less of the bid offer spread. So they may seem very, very small, but these small differences for this fund added up to $9.5 million across three years, which was an improved return of 77 basis points. So these tiny little differences really add up for firms that are trading a lot. So. So how do we, what are the key ingredients that help us get good execution? Well, a couple of things. Um, we try to get passive fills. So these markets typically have fairly large bid offer spread. So we would like to put a limit order where we get filled passively. So there's an example on the right. In this case, we are buying whatever we're buying. I think it's a two-year treasury. No, it's a euro dollar. So you can see that we put a limit order on the bid, that yellow box. And then in this case, we just wait for 32 minutes. The thing doesn't look like it's going to go anywhere. And so in this case, after about 32 minutes, we do get the order completed by somebody selling to us at the bid. And so that was worth $12.50 in this product. We could have executed earlier um, and paid the spread, but it's better to be patient and wait. Um, other things that happen. I mean, one of the biggest determinants overall is whether the market comes toward you or away. Um, we can't control that, but there's just an example there on the lower right. What you can see is we're a buyer, and we look good because the price comes down through us. Guess what? We get filled. We look like heroes. I'm not showing you the pictures where it goes the other way. Um, <laughs> but so, so I'm just saying there's a large sort of randomness in how we do, but these little, what we try to do is tweak the, the randomness one way or the other. But what I do want to emphasize is very short-term signals. So do we think over the next couple of minutes the price is likely to go up or, or go down, and should we try to execute right now in a hurry? Um, so those things are the biggest thing we can do that make a difference. So let me show you, oh, sorry, here's a sketch of our trading system. Um, it's more complicated than this, but basically on the left is an exchange, could be one or several exchanges, so it has a bunch of limit order books. Um, data passes through gateways, there's more than that, but I sketched it over on the right would be the external world, so clients send us orders, the orders go into gateways again, into our algorithmic trading engine, which is an engine that does all of this placing the orders and making the actual trading decision. That for us is written in C++, it's a proprietary in-house system, and then that sends out through the top messages to the exchange of the, the, all the limit orders and the fills, and then we receive market data back from the exchange, and what I wanted to emphasize here is the market data, that's the lower gateway, feeds into the algorithmic uh, execution because it needs to know what the market is doing, but also what I want to emphasize here is this purple box, which is the signal generator. So that's a process, and that's in KDB, KDB Plus for us, that receives market data, uh, applies various kinds of analytical computations and produces signals that basically say we think the price is going to go up, we think the price is going to go down, and feeds those into the trading engine. And then also underneath I drew logs, everything is logged. I didn't draw connection lines because it's connected to everything, and we also use KDB for the, for the logs, but that's a more familiar use, so I'm not going to talk about that. So just to give you some sense of data, just pictures that I happen to have sitting around, um, CME market data for the non-interest rate products is about 150 million messages per day, which roughly speaking across a 23-hour day is 2,000 messages per second on average through the day, so obviously the peaks are much, much higher. So it's a pretty good amount of data, and that's only for the top of book data, which is the trades and quotes. We also receive full order depth data, which is orders of magnitude larger. So those pictures I showed you had all the quotes at every level. It's much larger. Um, so 
loosely speaking, the kind of signals that we look for are fall into three categories. Usually, prices overshoot and relax, um, or related assets tend to move together, or you can detect various kinds of imbalances in the market, which uh, would argue that there's sort of the market has a sentiment one way, or the presence of large traders. So here's an example. Here's one of the most classic, one of the most classic signals. There are academic articles written about this. I give this one as an example in my class. Students have to compute this. So just as an example, what's shown here is what's called the microprice, which is the imbalance. You look at the balance between the quotes on the bid, quotes on the offer, and that interpolated value is that black line. So you can sort of see that when the red boxes increase, that's the offer size, that thing moves down. But what's significant about this is that commonly, before a price moves, this thing tends to move continuously. So you can sort of anticipate, let me take a risk here, but at that point, what you can see is that quotes are being withdrawn from the bid, the market is thinking this is not, this level is a little overpriced, so you can anticipate that the thing is likely to move down, and sure enough it does. Um, so, and so you can, you, can, you can guess that, you might, if you're a seller, you might want to cross the spread before, and then actually also help you anticipate when it comes up. And there are a bunch of signals that are related to that. You can look at trade imbalance, so it's actual market order, sells minus buy. You can look for the presence of large trades. You can look for trades with round number sizes. Those have different significance than other numbers. And they all sort of indicate what's happening from the other traders in the market. Um, another example, another signal that we use um, in various forms, and I bunch of examples I could have picked. I happened to pick a, a student paper that he wrote with me this year. So if you look at the top, the top picture there, you have, especially in futures, you have clusters of assets that are very closely related. So this is five treasury futures trading on CME, and he's accessing, this is a student at Princeton actually accessing it from a KDB database that I set up at Princeton. Um, but what you can see is those five price histories clearly move closely together. They're clearly related. And what you can see in the bottom picture, sorry, they're a little bit small, is that if you plot the price of one versus the price of the other, they tend to move along a line in five-dimensional space. And the significance of that is when, the, when they deviate from the line, you can forecast that they're likely to return to the line. And what his project was actually about was not that fact, which is pretty well known, but his project was about using machine learning techniques to identify when it's going to switch from one line to another line, because that's the tricky part. This is a signal that it's likely to revert, except when it doesn't, it does something different. Um, so here's a picture of how we use it. So what this is, this product is a UK Euribor uh, futures, which is a complex of short-term interest rates. There's, there's 10 or 15 of these. And so what's drawn is the red line is the price that we think this contract should be at to be in equilibrium with the other 10 or 15 products in the universe. So in particular, this is an example. We don't always get, get it right. What you can see where the arrow is pointing, actually the interpolated price moves above the offer, meaning that the other contracts in this complex have moved up. We therefore anticipate that this product will move up, and so we decide to cross the spread. It turns out to be wrong in this case, and the other ones come back down, but not always right. So we use this relationship between multiple products to um, forecast the price of this one. Um, and then just a note about this, as I said, we compute all of this in Q. There's a piece of Q code, um, pretty simple Q code. What I would say is, from a mathematical point of view, computing this project projection is a singular value decomposition, but for the, the problem? You don't believe it? What? <laughs> no. Excuse me? While loop is a little bit strange for K, but. Well, well, okay, so you tell, you tell, okay, so somebody, so see that I came to the right place. So somebody should tell me, somebody should tell me how to do this without a while loop. So what I'll say, so first of all, first of all, there is a package. What? <laughs> well, I'll get somebody a cup of coffee. Maybe they can tell me. No, so let me tell you. So, so there is a linear algebra package in KDB, SVD, which we initially use. Then we realized we don't actually have to. So for the math people, if you want only the largest singular value, that's actually really easy. So all you do is you do the power method. So what this loop does, I apologize, it's a while loop. What this loop does is we have a matrix. We multiply. We just keep multiplying by the matrix and then normalizing, and that converges very quickly to the first principal component. So you tell me, how do I do that without writing a while loop? Because it's iterative, because each one depends on the previous one. Um, I just need to, I don't, and it usually, I should say also, by the way, like the number of iterations is like one or two. This converges very, very fast. Um, 
So good. So I came to the right place. Um, <laughs> came to the right place. Okay. A few more examples, um, a little more schematic. So as I mentioned, another typical kind of signal is if the price moves rapidly, it's likely to revert. Here's an example. So in this case, the green bars indicate that we think the thing moved down, and so it's likely to come back. The yellow bars indicate that it recently has moved up sharply, so we think it's likely to come back. This, is, this has been in production for a couple years. But the other thing that comes out of this is not only the observation that it has gone up quickly and come back, but also we have, you know, our analysis suggests that there's a level that it's going to come back to plus a duration when it times out. Um, and then the other thing that I want to emphasize is that, you know, why am I not afraid to show you all of our trading secrets here? The reason is that there's actually a lot of other stuff underneath the hood, which is sort of, what, what did I say it here? So condition on other variables, so, so in the market. This is not always true. This is sometimes true in that the, it depends on things that I'm not showing you. Um, a few more examples. Here's another example that um, we just developed this spring. So um, Shankar Narayanan um, in my group. So, so we took some of the literature, the market literature on asset price bubbles, um, which is applied to daily data. And actually, if you apply that intraday, our intuition is that in these kind of markets, there tend to be momentum traders. So the price will move. There are a lot of automated strategies that will jump on it and say it's the beginning of a trend. And they therefore actually can cause the trend that they're predicting. So there's a pretty simple, you probably can't see it, but it's a simple, um, a simple, um, well, I, this is actually, it's not quite so simple as this, but a simple time series model that with, again, conditioned on several other variables can at least some of the time, detect the start of a momentum interval. So in this case, the thing detects the beginning. You can see the, the blue arrow, but also the little blue triangles indicate that the thing has started to move up. And actually, amazingly, it's also able to call the top. So, so that works pretty well. Um, what else did I want to say? Oh, and then we also, just sort of a schematic thing, I mentioned that since not true for futures, but cash bonds trade on multiple exchanges, so we're developing a machine learning algorithm to, to get, so you have a smart order routing problem, which is not only what orders do you send, but what exchanges do you send them to. So we've been exploring a bunch of techniques. We compute, I don't have pictures of them, but various features from price data on both of them, recent price change, quote size change, signed volume, we use some fairly standard uh, machine learning techniques. This is not yet in KDB, but it will be, and that helps us decide where to send where to send limit orders. Five milliseconds. It is an eternity. Okay, um, plenty of time. We can do a huge amount of five milliseconds. Um, so here is I should say also this is so perhaps a little embarrassing, but the structure of our KDB code is we have we have a KDB process that receives input data from a C plugin. That's the market data over here on the left. The update function goes through a set of functions, which we're in the process of refactoring it because it's gotten a little bit too complicated, but goes through a series of functions, various things here I've labeled or various signals that I've talked about, and then at the other end calls a C plugin that goes to our market data. So, and various of these things are some of the signals that I talked about. There's a sweep signal there in the middle. There's another one which we call the weak sweep. The co-integration is there on the left. Then there's a range signal which tells us where we are relative to previous prices. Um, and yeah, so it's, it's gotten a little bit complicated, but it's uh, basically a queue infrastructure connected on each end to C plugins. That's pretty much what I wanted to say. So, so I wanted to say that high frequency trading, it's pretty demanding computationally. Um, it's a fascinating subject, I would say. I would say the single biggest determinant of whether we get good results for the client is our ability to make short-term price predictions. So we process the market data to issue forecasts. And for us, KDB is a, you know, is a useful tool for the real-time processing. We feed stuff into KDB um, and use all of the, the good features to do that processing. So that's what I wanted to say. Great. Thank you.